Thank you very much. Sweet. <coughs> on print, by the way, for a very long time, while some might have already worked on the web. Uh, and I skipped the web, more or less, and dived directly in 2003, uh, working for Icon Mobile, um, and dived into mobile from the very beginning when there was no iPhone, and interesting times. So my job, my profession has, uh, during my career, let's say, I have been going through uh, yeah, various changes, and I also uh, like to thank you guys again for the invitation because I'm actually I'm more like an introvert person. You know, I'd like to close the door behind me. You know, in my house, I love I love my sofa, and once in a while, you know, uh, when getting such an invitation, you know, I have a chance to, you know, somehow contemplate and uh, you know have to drag myself on stage, you know, to in order to show you what I've contemplated about. So thank you for that. I've been uh, working for. <laughs> okay, so I've been working for Icon Mobile now for over 12 years, which is a ridiculous amount of years for an agency business. You know, and that's probably the same here in Czechoslovakia. Um, so we've been doing a lot of funny things, as I said, right from the beginning. Sounds good now, actually. Thank you. So we've been uh, we've been working on a lot of different mobile things, and I tried to skip over that fairly quickly because I realized it's not meant to be a two-hour talk, but that's roughly what the material I got with me, so I tried to speed up a little and skip a couple of slides. So we worked on uh, like the so-called iPhone killer back in the days <laughs> in 2007. Uh, actually, it didn't kill the iPhone really, but we knew that while we were building it already, so that was in the States. We've been um, discovering like for ourselves that it's actually quite uh, important to uh, use the, the like the, the space in between the static states, you know, when the, you can actually uh, do transitions and animations that in order to get some joy into interfaces. That was like something that we have done, um, that we have done all the launch. Uh, so we work our way through the mobile space, uh, did like everything you can, native uh, like mobile websites, native interfaces. Um, um, of course, like transfer applications and stuff, and also did strategic work then at some point. So we slowly worked our way up the. We worked our way up like the. Blue chain. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird microphone. If that continues like that, you know, I'm just gonna shout at you. No problem. <laughs> between like uh, just the magic, you know, between the humans and the machines. 
And uh, this is like, then, of course, it's embedded systems, which means that it's basically it's the same as an iPhone or something like that. It contains the same parts, but it's like assembled in a way, always for the purpose. Like uh, this, these touch displays that are built in here, for example, they need to be heat resistant, obviously, but because it's an oven. And, uh, and all the stuff gets stuck together. And um, yeah, and of course, and of course, this is important that you test it, you know, because it's uh, there's this, those platforms are not documented. You, know, you have to try out space, you know, latency, performance, etc. Interesting trip, interesting work. It takes ages to get this out of the door because it's a physical thing, you know, and it, it has a function. So that's something we do, which is kind of kind of interesting. Uh, something we are uh, currently um, getting a lot of um, acknowledgement at the moment is uh, the connected toothbrush, which sounds first of course kind of for most people like ridiculous. But then again, what it means for our client means that they basically have been rising, that they've been rising from being someone who produces and sells toothbrushes to someone who's taking. Uh, who's been taken very serious in all regards of uh, dental health care. Because with that data, they can, first of all, um, verify that there's active users involved, which is a totally different game from what they were doing before. We sell food, <coughs> and then they are gone, that's true. And, <laughs> yeah, and so basically we connected a lot of things uh, in the last years. It was uh, starting with uh, cars in uh, 2007 already for a show car, that later became like an Audi A1, uh, or like some, some treadmill that is kind of like as a product, not super attractive, you know, but once you uh, basically embed an interface to that, you know, it gets like a totally different kind of, kind of play. Uh, something that is kind of, I wouldn't say fashionable, but uh, service design is something that you need for problems like this. You know, we are uh, working together with the United Nations, and uh, now for a while, to basically help them uh, find, let's say, a solution that involves like digital artifacts to uh, to prevent or to improve like the rate of teenage pregnancies in Latin America. It's kind of a different job, yet it has something to do with like our understanding of what design can uh, in regards to transformational activities. So second try. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we also got a daughter company actually. All they do is they work on automotive interfaces, meaning uh, dashboard, head up display, uh, information units, uh, concepts for the autonomous driving, etc. Some of that might know that actually. Um, interesting company. We work very closely with them. And then we have like a startup uh, in our company, which is called Banbutsu. And Banbutsu is a platform for the Internet of Things. All it does is basically take whatever there is, and it's currently it's uh, not even in beta stage. Um, and I'm afraid I cannot show you any of the interfaces, but it's quite interesting. It's basically made for the end consumer, uh, so you can actually add regulations and conditions to to wire all these things, so they make actually sense for you and it's digestible. So it's also like a huge experience effort behind that. Uh, just like business-wise, a little bit of different direction. So let me try to quickly talk about the experience economy. Um, <laughs> so um, what we always try to make clear to our um, to our clients is that. You know, like a digital product needs as much love, you know, as a physical product. We spend more time in the digital, more and more time in the digital space. So those tools are, you know, need equally uh, being paid attention in terms of, of details. And uh, it seems that everything that is supposed to become, that could potentially become digital, is at some point going to become digital. And I don't exclude the thought, you know, that there could be like, you know, at some time, you know, there's going to be a trend backwards, you know, when we go back to the analog. At the moment, it's like, it's different. The digital transformation is um, affecting like all sorts of industries. Some more and some less. I mean, those little uh, examples, I guess you know. 
I mean, but even like in the digital, uh, during the digital times, you know, it seems that every, for example, we, we thought about getting into the space of smart TVs, you know, and once you looked into the process, you know, how you get an application on a, on a TV, it's a very cumbersome process because none of the manufacturers has actually figured that out in a way that, for example, Apple did. So it can be that you, like, um, first of all, it's like no standardization, you know, so it's like a huge effort in the end. And now Amazon comes and sells for 39.95. You know, they sell like the Fire Stick. I don't know who of you guys have a Fire Stick. It's the shit. It's really cool. You know, it's really, you plug it in your HDMI, and there's a little computer on top, you know, in, inside this tiny USB lookalike stick, you know, and uh, it starts to stream full HD. Uh, Dolby Sound, and it works. There's a uh, there's a, a very nice remote control with it, you know. So it's so basically all the effort, you know, that all the manufacturers are actually spending in like finding like paradigms, you know, how to operate um, these smart TVs. You know, it's completely I don't know. It's like 40, you know, from making a dumb TV to a smart TV, like in 40 euros. That's um, that's kind of revolutionary. The thing is, what I think what we see is though that, that people stop buying stuff like mad. So th they don't consume in a way that they uh, used to. You know, they just, uh, I think the accumulation of stuff is now pretty much left behind. The people are rather want to accumulate experiences. And I think the reason is, so I heard that that's the best example so far, is that whatever you, like your digital me does, you know, on Facebook, or the, the picture that you're trying to present to the outside somehow feeds back into your real life. So you try to live up to that standard that you try, you know, you always think about what to post, you know, to make you look in a particular way. And then suddenly you try to, to be a better person, you know, and that's, you realize that on Facebook it also doesn't work, you know, once you post a photo with you and your new car and your new girlfriend and all that stuff that nobody cares about that because status symbols actually, I think, are not as important as they used to be, you know, also thanks to the social media. So if you need to sell stuff, you know, then you better do that in a way, you know, that it uh, feeds into the, like, what people actually do and what they actually like, you know, which is the experiences. And Nike actually showed that um, in a very impressive way. Most people on the market, they are having a huge difficulty with the digital transformation. So the usual thing what's happening, you know, is that, that they start somewhere in analog land, you know, and like just think of especially like old industry players and they just move somewhere. Some are just, you know, they have a website by now that which is fine, you know, some have, you know, some just have like a great Facebook site, which is also okay. But none of it, you know, a lot of people, like a lot of companies actually, they don't look any further. You know, there is so much stuff that can happen. But if you are, you know, in a particular company culture, you just don't move any further than that, you know. You just are used to spend, like, a budget for, I don't know, advertisement, for example, you know, which you then shift to a website or something like that. It's not that they think that this could be, like, the next bigger model. What, in the last couple of years, actually pretty much changed our profession, it got us more attention, I mean, except for, uh, let's say, Steve Jobs and the iPhone, is the fact that um, during, let's say, like the, the development of the businesses, we now not only know how to build stuff, you know, and how to market it, we, we mostly have like a deficit somewhere in the market, you know, to understand what the people actually need and what they want because nobody cared so far. Usually, like an ordinary company has like a customer care hotline, you know, which they call, and that is that is that, you know, that's the channel to the customer, you know, they are not much more interested about anything else. That's from, yeah, it's a month old actually, so even the Harvard Business Review has like design thinking on the cover now, which means that it now, at least, you know, it um, design as a discipline somehow, um, obviously it evolved, uh, where actually even the management, you know, looks into it and try to find it somewhere in there in their company. It's a very good, by the way, a very good issue. I would definitely buy it, you know, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's in the end. It is a very commercial point of view, of course, but like where's the value of design exactly lie? I mean, the problem is that 
at least that's what I'm thinking, you know, as long as you, as a designer, and you are and talk with a business person and you can't actually make sure where your value exactly lies, you always will have a difficult time, you know, actually um, convincing someone, you know, why they should pay you only half of what like a normal decent consultant, for example, would get. And that's quite normal, you know, and this is why I just say, like from one designer to another, that this is something that we need to get better at. I think we, we had like an exercise at some point, you know, where we evaluated a couple of companies according to the organization structure models, you know, the design process model, um, also roles and responsibilities and all that stuff. So where does design in a particular company sits, etc. cetera? Um, you know, how does it affect like the operation and what comes out? And of course, like it, it fosters innovation. It um, enhances the customer experience and the time to market. You know, you can increase through design, but in the end, you know, what, what counts for the business people, you know, is in, an, in, in a nutshell, it's like money. And that is usually measured in selling more units, selling more expensive. Um, also, like, let's say if it's like a, you know, on a product level, if it's more like a subscription or business model or something like that, it's like the, like in the operator space, you know, it would be like the ARPU, the average, the average revenue per user. That's that's like KPIs that they understand. And you can pull the trick, and I've, I've seen it, you know, designers simply taking out the, the annual numbers, you know, from a company, looking at the markets, looking at the shares, just saying, okay, if this is where you're strong, you know, let me, and just do a good guess, you know, do a little equation and a couple of assumptions to, in the end, calculate really with numbers, like the return of invest, which is kind of interesting, but it's really hard to do. So all I'm saying is design, uh, and this is like part of the permanent identity crisis here with all the experienced designers, you know, where do I belong, etc. I think it wasn't different from the developers in the 70s or so, you know. We'll find our way somewhere, um, but in the end, like what value you provide, you know, is currently like really difficult to calculate, you know, and to justify, but this is definitely something to wrap ahead around. Um, so from my very personal perspective, you know, what I witnessed is, you know, I, I, I mean, there were a couple of stages for me before that, you know, but at some point, you're creating a brand, you know, you create a logo, all of that, that becomes commodity at some point. And that goes on and on and on, you know, and when I stumbled into the, the mobile space, like, whatever, like 12 years ago or so, I had no clue about interaction design, but I learned what it is, you know, and then interaction design now is like more or less, you know, there are a lot of good schools now out there, not enough probably, but it's rolling, you know, it's progressing, and, you know, that. but this is pretty much centered all around the experience, so basically on a timeline, you know, how a person interacts with, for example, a product or a particular service, but it's usually, it's pretty much limited to one touch point. So then came service design, which does exactly the same, plus like it uh, goes like the whole experience over time through several touch points, including like humans, you know. So I think the DNA of service design is much more on a human-human level, you know, and now we have the Internet of Things, which means like that we also, you know, and I'm not sure whether this means that this all accumulates after time, you know, in our brain. It's probably just like different sorts of specializations in the end, you know, but there is something happening and it happens fast, you know. So in order to wrap that up more or less, it's, uh, things are changing, you know, also for us. And the problem is that now if I look back on my career so far, you know, it was like oh, every few years there was something new. And a lot of things I have in this talk, I found like that this stuff like this is like a month old or two months old, you know, because there is there is so much stuff happening, you know, every week. So what's the offering of those kinds of designers? I mean, the the service guys from Transformator, they are like one of the most well known in their field. Um, I just. You know, they just introduced something like that, which was like touch point design. I think that's the user experience design. You know, this is once you want to make an application, for example. Uh, the service design, I guess, it's like whatever the customer is supposed to see, you know, on a larger scale over different touch points. The system design, the organizational design is like kind of interesting. The system design, I guess, is like whatever is under the hood. And the organizational design is exactly what I've been talking about before. It's like the trouble that they have actually transform, you know. You are, that's, that's something that you realize once you're dealing with a client, you know, they, they don't have, there's a very, very heavy gravity, you know, pulling 
the user experience stuff you know, to the ground, basically, because it's very engineering driven, or they don't know it, etc. And But you know that it's good for them, and maybe, and sometimes you have like one bright person, ideally this bright person sits right on top, you know, and then you can move stuff. So it's very important to transform the companies as well, because, I mean, in the end, the way I see it, you know, it's like um, we are making our money with that, with those clients. And even if we are progressing, if they stand still, you know, over a long run, you know, that doesn't help us really, you know, except we have to look for other clients then. What I hear a lot from clients is actually, you know, I uh, just let's do it like in a, in a different way, you know, it's like maybe we can do it in a way that nobody actually sees that we are doing it, you know, because it's not the people usually that don't want to progress and that they don't want to, they actually they want to grow, you know, they want to do something great, but it seems that the structure, uh, the processes, the company culture, usually it, it doesn't, it's not compatible. And nowadays I would say that they even have more clients nowadays approaching us in, in that way, you know, and then we have those who are saying like, you know, they are all completely crazy, you know, for doing some uh, interesting work. It's really like the opposite, you know, they are all struggling with their structures. So what I learned over the last couple of weeks, what seems to work pretty well for most of the service designers is really to infiltrate the companies more or less. So um, they are becoming change agents. They are like the designers go there, they do workshops, they train the trainers in order to then uh, create like a ripple effect that goes through the whole company. Um, and that is kind of very interesting to see that there is like a mutual interest in actually improving like your condition of work that you will find enough people actually to change that. And usually, I mean, for there's change managers and there's ch change agents, prof professional ones, but it, those change uh, processes, they take a long, long, long time. They go over years, you know, you need concepts, you need to sit down with the people, etc. And I think that design can do a fair share, you know, in actually transforming those companies. That gets in particularly very interesting, you know, when you think about like uh, the clients that they have. It's not that they, this is now, if we switch off the commercial view and go into like a bigger picture, they work a lot for authorities and even for states. You know, UK, the Scandinavian countries, you know, those those countries, you know, they spend a lot of money to basically support the creative industries. They want that to move forward because they know it's good for them. And what it results, you know, is that basically citizens, for example, or the people, the society, actually has a totally different view on the services that their state provides. You know, how to pay better taxes, how to find a job, all these institutions getting reworked because they suck. I mean, they suck also in Germany, I'm not as bad as in other companies, uh, countries maybe, but it's still, so that is something that is super interesting. And as you know, like, you know, us as designers, it's all about prototyping. And I just, like, I have an educational classic here. You know, it's like uh, from 66. Um, Walt Disney actually already had the idea of like a very small island of society, you know, that was meant as a prototyping community. You know, that's, there is a lot of stuff on YouTube. Unfortunately, he died pretty soon after you know, he was raising funds, etc. So it didn't come to life in a way, but the plans are so detailed already that it's really worth watching now on, uh, on YouTube. Um, this is, I just wanted to show you that, you know, because this is a classical, no, it's not a classical double diamond design process, but it's like, let's say a slightly altered one. Um, because if you have more complex pro problems, you know, I mean, you always have, have to pick like the design process that's right for your project, obviously. But what I believe in is that more and more it's going, going to be uh, you know, inevitable and hard to avoid, you know, to actually do like this first diamond where you go into discovery phase first, doing research a lot, you know, in order to analyze that. That's when the diamond, the first diamond closes and opens up. This is where you actually do the work, you know, the concepting, etc., etc., to then nail it down and apply it. And I think the only reason I'm showing you that is because I think that if you think about the rapid change, you know, I think something that is kind of resisting the change is the capability to understand what people need and put out facilitation material that enables the other people to make decisions because you are not the decision maker, you're the facilitator, you know, for the material and then to help implementing this stuff. And that is like my definition of uh, like a bulletproof or future proof designer at the time. 
there is also another perspective, of course, on that, which is, you know, just in case you asked yourself, you know, where like the older people go, you know, in the design business. So this lady was hired by IDO not too long ago. She has some fancy name, but my speaker notes are uh, blank. So, um, so anyway. She did a lot of stuff, you know, in the healthcare field, you know, and she, she offered her services with a handwritten letter, you know, to RDO. They said, like, yeah, well, we do a lot of work, actually, for elderly people. Why don't you be, like, our permanent, you know, for... So she sits on the sofa, you know, um, whatever, in, like, two offices during the week, in, in like, changing, you know, interchanging, and, uh, you know, and gives, like, very good feedback, obviously, and input, you know, to the project. Another uh, kind of design field which I uh, found extremely fascinating is like the so-called design fiction. There are some guys from the Near Future Laboratory. I mean, that's uh, just the name alone is pretty cool. And they did in uh, San Francisco a workshop in February, uh, which was about the future. So I think the exercise was something like the quick start manual for your first autonomous car or something like that. And I think that's it's important. It's important to have like an idea of the future, which brings me to the future. Um, some guy said in the 60s, you know, once they landed on the moon, they were like, they were totally psyched, you know, they were totally thrilled, and they said, like, we can do anything. Now we can do anything, you know, we just landed on the moon, you know, with cameras even. Or was it? Was it a fake? I, we don't know. Anyway, so we believe they landed on the moon, you know, and everybody was super excited. And I think we are in a similar time at the moment. I mean, maybe I'm a bit more excited than you are, you know, but um, I'm very optimistic, you know, that we can do all the stuff. The only thing that, that happens to me all the time, you know, is like uh, sometimes it lacks the reason, you know, why to do some certain things. <laughs> You know, so um, so I discovered that that we have like a certain idea about the future. You know, there is like the trend and the trend research. You know, and it's like the mega trend, and so basically this this just moves. You know, some moving faster than others. You know, a fad is basically a trend that whoop, you know it's like almost gone like that. You know, and the mega trend is like you know we're aging. You know, less young people, more old people, something like that. And this is what we know. It is like the most typical representation of that. You know, the uh, emerging technology hype cycle from Gardner, that's like the reference, gets uh, new every year. And on that curve, you know, like somewhere there, somewhere there, there's the mass market, you know, and this is like some stuff that moves in a certain pace, you know. And this is basically the speed here, you know, displayed, how fast it goes through the curve. And that's like basic stuff, but it's like, it's uh, something that it's great to consider once you design the project, you know, and you need references. Um, but... I think it's not enough, you know, to envision, to envision the future in which we like to live in. There is uh, the good old Isaac Asimov, who used to be a science fiction writer. Um, yeah, he did in 1964 for the year 2014, so basically 50 years ahead, he did like a couple of uh, best guesses, you know, based on his writing and his knowledge. And with some things he was actually not really on it, you know, and with some he was like pretty precise, you know, spot on. And I have like even like somewhere, I have like another examples, you know, from the, like, that were like a hundred year prediction starting in 1900 in Paris. That's equally nice, you know, I would say 50% is like, nah, not so much, you know, and 50% is like, wow, that's pretty accurate. Uh, because those people, you know, they, from a professional point of view, they thought about the future, and I think we, we don't, you know, the culture, uh, like the, the companies also don't. Of course, I checked the Czech uh, kind of science fiction uh, history, you know, as well, at least I looked into it, because you have a really rich science fiction history. And I think, I mean, I just, this was really the first I got, you know, and I don't know who of you guys know that movie? Some of you do. I mean, just the plot alone, you know, that this poor guy choked on the croissant in the morning, you know, actually wanted me to see the movie, but I didn't find, like, an English version of it. So anyway, I think you are well prepared for the future, you know, of what I can say. And that is, that is important, because also during, the, the, during your work, you know, what you need, at, at least what we need, you know, is like we start somewhere in the now, we try to envision for our clients, like, a certain future, or let's say uh, version 3.0 or something like that, and we retropolate, you know, which is then there, you know. We need to derive that, because usually 
it's often not realistic, you know, to with a whatever you try to create, like to start right away with a finished perfect product, you know. So it's uh, always good to start with some sort of a vision and then derive something. Um, also, like historical fact here. You know, and there is like actually people who do that, you know, who actually work on bigger projects. We just work on software mostly, you know, which is all kind of nice. And this year, this fancy book called Double Star, you know, from the year, I don't know when, um, from 1974. This is something that now slowly takes shape, you know, uh, known as the Hyperloop from the guy who brought us the Tesla. And what did he found? The PayPal. I mean, he really delivers, you know, I don't know if you followed that Tesla story, you know, it's quite in impressive, you know, so everything he touches so far turned into gold. I mean, not really because the company is not really profitable, but it's like from an innovation standpoint, you know, that's, that's the, the, the mind-boggling stuff that's really interesting. So, um, I think when Anishka asked me for a name for the talk, which I tried to find a very cool one, I didn't know, I totally didn't know what to tell you actually. Um, but what I found on my way was basically this year, which I found like a good start for, um, which made me think, you know, about certain things. You know, IA is the new UI. You know, what does it mean? It means that, I mean, exactly what I said. You know, I think that also at some point, you know, you were a good visual designer. You know, if you are, were great, you know, then you knew a little bit about user research, a little bit of production, and a little bit in between, and then you could build like a little bit of software pretty much on your own. And uh, now that is more or less commodity, you know, in the schools they, they just learn it like that, you know, it's like nothing special anymore, it just permanently evolves. And I also see it that way that once everything is nicely and consistent and simple to use and like a little bit of joyful and maybe even branded, you know, with a little bit of, you know, some sugar coating on top, you know, that's what, what then. And of course, what it comes down to is basically the, the characteristics of a tool, you know. All what we do, all what we build, you know, might be physical, might be software stuff, you know, rather virtual. It's all, it all is meant to serve us in some way. Some things didn't serve us so well, you know, it's like a bit clunky maybe, you know, it's like sometimes the computer also costed us more time than it actually saved us, you know. But this is, I think, we understand that as a permanent state of uh, experimentation. And where we are now, if I just like think about like the, the basics, you know, it's like I think that that what could use us is uh, nowadays I think is like the context, you know, like the contextual information in order to help us a little bit better from a piece of software point of view. And then we have like this hyper local advertisement that was like something that went around I think last year. So this is always when this, you know, this button comes, you know, are you willing to share your location? Yes. And then maybe or maybe not, you know, it somehow helps you. What happens pretty often, I think, is the same as with the with the freaking Google ads. You know, once you watch something somewhere, you know, it's like it follows you the rest of the day on every website. You know, but it's actually, but but frankly, that's the big thing that now, given back my uh, my history, you know, this is what I hated about advertisement. You know, it's basically it's penetration. It's just like yeah, you have channels and you use them to rub a message in your face. And, you know, and it doesn't apply like a logic necessarily. And the same is now with the Google ads, you know, it might be that there is a relation, but maybe not, you know, it doesn't really matter. But this is like, but all the data mining must, must be good for something. But partially they do a good job, you know, they know where my home is, they know where my work is, and Google Maps, you know, that works pretty well. So I think it's all about contextualization. And, um, but we are not there quite yet, you know, so. So when we now think about like the artificial intelligence, you know, I think it's it's certainly artificial. It's not yet intelligent. Let's just quickly look in here. Science fiction of today, you know, this is all stuff that exists now. You know, it's like the smart object, like the artificial entities, you know, or like some sort of a smart system. I'm pretty sure that, you know, I don't know, flying cars would probably go into smart objects. We don't have them yet, you know, but I'm sure they work on that. So in terms of objects, you know, the day the doorbell rings you, I, I love that. You know, it's like the Internet of Things, for example. We know that there is a lot of stuff going to happen, for sure. It's, um, you know, I, I guess that probably most of it will be crap at some point because, as they say, you know, whatever can be connected will be connected because that's just how industry operates. But at the moment, it's not. There is no infrastructure. It doesn't. It doesn't really work. 
in a way, I think the best example so far I saw was to demonstrate like the Internet of Things was that to go from like a virtual one click to actually you know provide within the context you know a one click interaction that was pretty brilliant and I have to say that Amazon pretty much amazes me every year a little bit more. I think they are already too strong you know the same as with Apple you know I think it's all too. Uh, monocultural on the market, but I have to admit they do an excellent job here. I mean, those things, they matter because the more complex your life gets, you know, the more important actually convenience gets for you. You know, but the hassle actually to install that stuff, you know, it's all like, I don't know, it's a little bit of a pain. So my colleagues, you know, they, they tinker around a lot, you know, because they, know they need a lot of showcases, you know, for their uh, IoT platform. So this is like a pill dispenser, you know, it simply counts. You know how many pills you have dispensed. You know, and at some point when you're getting like to a certain low, you know this actually would order like new pills for you directly, automatically, and then that would be displayed in your bathroom mirror, for example. You know that thing is gesture controlled. Um, it's not new. We did it last year, but we built a couple of those and evolved that as a product, as a physical product, because we do a lot of tinkering as well. So we have like. No workbenches and 3D printers and shit, you know, what God knows what. And that now uh, is more and more interesting because the no matter what kind of industry players come into our premises, they are all heavily impressed just by the sheer, uh, you know, by the sheer scope, you know, of what we can create in-house. Then again, I think the we are really having a hard time for the Internet of Things to come up with, let's say, um, very convincing use cases. In my personal opinion, I think the people, we have to empower them, you know, to do it themselves. You know, something very simple to find out, you know, is it important at this point, you know, in, in the space, in my room, in the kitchen, you know, that, that it's moist, you know. Is that something I want to know, for example. And there are a couple of kits, uh, like of toolkits out there, you know, that the one is Sam here. Sam is from the RCA, from uh, the Royal College of Art in London, together with the Imperial College of Engineering technology, I don't know really, but you know they sell that stuff. For example, same with the, same is with IBM. You know, and I, I totally see that, or I don't, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, if basically the people just would buy a kit, the community would actually add a little bit of uh, information and context, and then the people just assemble that themselves. You know, in because they do it for the IKEA as well. So you might you might enjoy that here. I mean, how many people knew that the term robot was coined right here? I mean, not right here, but in the city. Exactly, because I was clueless, you know? So I was like, shit, you know? I even found this fancy photo here of the uh, premiere from 1921. And, uh, and of course, like the robots, I think I just threw in because they are just a great symbol, you know, for future. Always have been. They're also like still like one of the most popular motives, I think, in uh, contemporary science fiction. What goes along currently with the robot is that term here, the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is um, basically just saying that if it's somehow, if it looks like a tool, you know, this robot looks like a tool, you know, then it doesn't mean no harm, it's kind of okay. If it looks even closer to a human, but something is off, you know, then it's like really scary. You know, so I think that the robots themselves, but this is like a purely aesthetical theory that was like from the, from when? From the 70s, from a Japanese guy. And I think what he couldn't foresee is actually that through, that we are pretty okay with that stuff, you know, because now we have video games. So from an aesthetical point of view, you know, we already saw a lot of, we are used to the evolution, you know, of like a, something aesthetical, you know, but that doesn't give us the creeps, you know, it, like once it manifests like um, physically, it's, it's still slightly different, but the thing is that there is like two things, the one is the outer shell and the other is the intelligence part, you know, and I think the intelligence part to me is like a little bit more scary. Yeah, I mean, this is basically how this curve actually looks like. So quickly, robots. Um, just we can cross that off the list. So this is like a very sexy small robot. Why? Because it weighs 18 grams and it carries a camera. <laughs> I thought that's kind of pretty cool. 
that thing has been in development like for years and it gets lighter and it gets better it's get longer enduring um, something relatively new is that drone that actually absorbs shocks so you can throw that in every building you know that's about to collapse you know it just flies which is very uh, it's a Swiss startup I think who did that of course in terms of humanoids you know there's Asimo I'm pretty sure that this name is no coincidence um, yeah, and he, of course, he does like a lot of nice things. He serves uh, drinks, etc. You know, go on YouTube, watch a couple of videos. It's really entertaining. It's really impressive, but it's not scary, really. Talking of scary, of course, there is that thing. It's called Atlas. Um, the Atlas is created by Boston Dynamics. Unfortunately, it's funded by the DARPA, who is like uh, basically the US military. So and it looks already like that, you know. Still doesn't really scare me. I mean, uh, there's like, uh, there has been a video uh, put out like, I don't know, like two weeks ago, three or four, where they actually have him run in the woods. That's a little bit scarier. I mean, he's still like completely wired, you know. It doesn't autonomic, like uh, as an autonomous organism, just run through the woods. It just has like a bunch of cables hanging behind him, which is like kind of funny. Um, but it looks pretty massive, you know. It can hold the balance, you know. So if you throw a ball at him, you know, it doesn't collapse. You know, it's like, it's interesting. How I ended actually up with the robot thing at all, you know, is basically because we work for a, a kitchen, uh, for a um, household appliances manufacturer, is of course these things here. Anybody knows Jibo? You've seen that thing? Has been like there for like a year out there, I think, or now a year ago, so it was probably still a like a, um, what's it called, like a, a Kickstarter project. I mean, just take a quick look at it. Tell me what you think. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell. Nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Good night, Jibo. Jibo, this little bot of mine. What if technology actually treated you like a human being? Okay, so that was the uh, lady from the MIT who actually started that thing. So I mean, it's it's still I think it still uh, works wonders on me. You know, I already start to hate my future. You know, but um, 
But there is something interesting about it, you know, which is it's not the cheesy American way, you know, this thing is basically pe put into scene, you know, I see a lot of potential behind that, but it's not the, the outer shell, you know, of a robot, you know, that actually scares me, it's more like the, you know, the uh, accumulated knowledge, you know, in the system. I think for those of you who don't know that one here, I spare you like the, I mean, it's equally great uh, commercial actually behind it, but the Amazon Echo, uh, the Amazon Echo is, uh, I think, even scarier, you know, because it doesn't interact with you. When you saw like this nice, uh, there is actually like a, also like design-wise, the complete history, you know, of like the Jibos, of Jibos eyes, you know, how that thing works, you know, and how it interacts and how it, you know, contextually, you know, is being moved. Here, that thing has not much but it listens to you wherever you are in the house, you know, or like in the room, you know, and that is like, and that, you know, I think the, the, the abstraction, you know, of whatever happens there, you know, that the fact that you don't really know and the fact that this thing, you know, is, uh, you know, actually very clever, you know, that is something that I found, that I found rather scary. So let's maybe just hop on to you know, those smart systems, you know. Um, pretty sure you've seen, like, at some point in your life, like 2001. It's, uh, this is Hell, you know, the uh, very automated, like, I think one of the, the nicest <laughs> uh, intelligent systems there is, like with the conscience. And it's, I only mention that because it has been in the press a lot over the last coming weeks, you know, that, like, a lot of people, actually, who are kind of smart, actually warned about the uh, artificial intelligence. The thing is, I think so far I can only say, you know, uh, I did a little bit of research, you know, and there are different voices, you know, but it seems it's clear to say that there is something that is the, the point which is scary. We are still like a little bit far away from that, which is once they become self-improving, you know, that's being a critical point in artificial intelligence, because then what I learned what's happening, you know, is an intelligence explosion. And the, ex <laughs> the intelligence explosion, you know, it happens, you know, then they are just pretty much, you know, just getting smarter very, very fast, which is, could be, I would say like a solution to a lot of problems, you know, that we as humans cannot face. And the, the actual concern of those people is, you know, that we don't know how to keep that under control. And that's, that's basically the end of the story about artificial intelligence because um, the closest we are in the consumer world at the moment, you know, is uh, with the smart assistants such as Siri in your iPhone, or in that case, something that is currently in beta state, you know, that's Facebook M. Although it doesn't look like an M, but it's an M. Or it's supposed to, post, supposed to be one. And what I think Facebook then uh, differentiates like from others is that this thing here actually also executes orders in your, on your behalf. So you can order stuff, for example. And it's all equally semi... It's not intelligent. It's not intelligent, it's smart. No. So it's contextual. So there's contextual data, yet, you know, it's uh, just if you think about about your best friend who knows you really well, you know, if he would be just be at your side all the day, he still <laughs> wouldn't have a chance, you know, to actually know, to help you contextually all the time, you know, because there are simply things, you know, that you can't get out of a human, you know. So it's, um, I think our brain is like, works you know, very, in a very complex way. Uh, also pretty relatively new, Cortana, you know, it's also an assistant now with Microsoft, just got launched. Kind of interesting, also interesting that this, that this funny ring here, you know, has also like a completely behavior on its own, you know, which is, um, which you can easily compare with the Jibo, with the Jibo one. So what does this thing do? I mean, what, the only case that I actually liked was when you talk into it, you know, and say like, remind me if I, um, if I'm in contact with my sister to tell her, you know, how lovely her puppy is or something like that. And no matter what kind of channel you're choosing, it will remind you, you know. This is kind of interesting, but it's also not super smart, you know. It's like another use case, but it's also not super clever. Um, what is then, you know, also basically in the same league, you know, as the Google Now, slash Google Now on tap. So the Google Now is like to the left, you know, there was like an earlier version and the Google Now on tap means that you do a long press on the middle button there. And if you just, if you just let's say, talked about um, whatever, like a particular film or something like that, you know, it will contextually propose you stuff. And then you can 
with like one tab, you know, do like book a table for something, buy a ticket or something like that. So that's the next best thing. What I found like a little bit, obviously, um, yeah, let's say uh, con like uh, it's worth a concern is of course that Google also bought like a couple of other things, you know, that are already in your home, you know, and like a camera in your home, you know, and like the thermostat, you know, the, the um, like the, um, the Nest one in your home, and you don't know where these data, I mean, they are going to the cloud some way, you know, and from the cloud, you know, know where they actually going, because it's, uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, so in the end, I think this is something to, to watch out for, you know, because we seem to have very few players, you know, in that market that are kind of interesting for us, and they accumulate all our personal data. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like one of the of the funnier moments. Then, <laughs> um, you know, 32 million users, 9.7 gigabytes. You know, that's a lot of stuff. You know, that has been like basically breached, and that I'm pretty sure if you let's say 32 million users, I don't know, maybe one million tech-heavy wives, I think that leads at least to whatever, 5,000 divorces or something like that, I'm not sure. But anyway, so this stuff that has an impact, you know, and I think that data is not necessarily safe, and we all know that, you know, no matter where we look. So I guess that the, the, the good news is like on the, on the left hand, you know, it's like data breach, it's like that's the bad news, you know, it's like that can happen all the time because it happens all the time, you know, but then again, you know, we won't have like any killer androids, you know, getting rid of us in the next couple of years, I think. Something to consider, of course, that's also like another thing is uh, the question, you know, um, these little smart things, you know, and I think, um, you know, taking a little bit of time, you know, to think about that and contemplate, you know, if I have more and more help, you know, like, and like the, the latest thing I can think about, you know, which I know for sure is like navigation systems, you know, I used to fiddle around with the map back, you know, a couple of years back, and now I don't anymore. And of course, I realize that I don't know shit about like a particular part of town, even if I have driven through that, you know, a gazillion times because I don't pay attention, you know, because I don't understand it, because the machine does it for me. Then again, you know, it's like those cumbersome tasks, you know, that I don't necessarily want to deal with anyways. But the question is really, or the, like one of the generic questions, you know, is uh, that is always worth discussing is if we are getting actually more and more stupid, you know, which is a theory that also goes in line with, um, let's say, the ongoing personalization. That's another theory I heard, you know, that the more uh, the more you're actually living your life, you know, even more and more personalized, the more you know about whatever else is happening in the world, you know. But I'm not sure if this is actually true. So what I think, you know, when, come, when it comes to envision the future, you know, I'd be totally happy, you know, with you know, having a little bit more time for myself, or maybe a lot of time, that would be great, you know, and of course, like, peace everywhere, you know, and personal freedom, and of course, a little bit of money would be quite well, and the concept there, um, I think, is that everybody should have, like, a personal robot that actually earns the money for us, you know, because that's a pretty likely scenario, <laughs> because there's only this, I mean, that's two extremes, right, it's either the, the, the Cyberdyne system, kind of uh, dystopia, you know, machines are getting smarter, then they're going to kill us, you know, then they're going to have whatever robot party here on Earth. And the other is actually, you know, that, you know, we actually put more and more power to the machines so that actually the machines doing all the labor for us. The negative version would be also, you know, I'm losing my job, which is also not impossible, you know, you're being replaced by a machine, happened in the past, so, so, but I have like a tendency towards the more utopian version, you know. So having a robot, you know, everybody should have a robot. They do work, we at the swimming pool, you know. And of course, I think that you are guys, you know, are the experts in that because, you know, have had like nearly 100 years of experience now after inventing the robot. And I think that was it for now. Thank you. So, we made like, hold on, it doesn't say, 68 slides in one hour. I think that's a good average pace. <laughs> 
So, do you guys have any weird questions or you want to go straight for drinks? Let me know. I have a microphone here. But I heard the Czech are rather shy usually. So, oh, look at you. Oh, um, I just realized I have not like the usual microphone, you know, which I can just throw over. So. I'm just curious if you, if you would share the slides because there was a lot of interesting information there to like, look after. Yeah, uh, yeah, I intend to upload it. <laughs> so, a more intellectual question then? <laughs> Please. That's funny. That's like it's it's very very popular here in Czech because I just learned about it. Now I think that somebody might have told me about that. It was you? No, not you. Yeah, I've been I've been I've been told, but I haven't seen it. It's like whatever is like like four. Well, my question was just if uh, you think that's the way how to discuss the topics because uh, the Black Mirror is dealing with the topic like the intelligent uh, media. What is it doing to our social? Life. No, I think the time is definitely the right one to think about it because it's really that you know it's it's it feels like like something that uh, as designer as a from from a, from a professional point of view you need to do but then again I think from a society point of view you know we also should do that pretty quickly except you don't just don't care you know and you just you know then then it's fine you know but I think that this is uh, equally important. Because at the moment, I think we have a lot of chances, you know, to change little things. It might, it, I'm, I'm totally, you know, we, we produce stuff, we get stuff out of the door, we earn money with that, you know, that's, we, we are in the business, we are a service company. Um, yet, you know, and even if it sounds cheesy, you know, I think I, I see it pretty obviously, you know, that there is a good time to change stuff, you know, starting with the social media, but going on to like the tools and also from our side, from a design point of view, you know, we can influence stuff because there are only a few of us. Go to any bigger design conference, you know, like, I don't know, the key conferences, you know, there's like a thousand people there or so. Go to a service design conference, you know, I've been to one like a week ago, it was like, maybe it's like 600 people, 500 people. So it's like a, a very small circle of people at the moment, you know, are really interested to, to get into that. That's no, that we wouldn't do that, you know. If if that would, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's but this needs to go on the mobile phone, on every mobile phone first, you know. And there is not so much space on the mobile phones to put any stickers on, but that would be the first one, like when it comes to social um, awkwardness, you know. No, I think we we have to. That's I think the mobile phone is a good example, you know. There is like sort of a let's say, uh, a certain code, you know, of um, like a social code, you know, how to behave with a mobile phone, you know, you know, somebody's talking to you, you look in the mobile phone, someone's giving talk, you look in the mobile phone, or you're sitting with your mom, you know, at the table, and the phone's ringing, all that stuff, you know, is something that we just don't know yet, you know, it's going to take a while until we actually have like a certain, how we develop like a certain behavior, you know, and a certain code. But we can actually make it up ourselves as well, you know, a good reason, because there is none yet, you know, that is, it's not set in stone. And I think for every technology that's going to come its way, uh, I've been to, uh, like, with a friend at a gynecologist, you know, one day, and it just simply said, had a sign, you know, on top saying, like, you know, no Google glasses beyond this point, you know, which is funny, you know, because, of course, nobody has a Google Glass in, like, outside of California, as far as I know, like, mostly. I mean, we have one in the company, but... The people are not wearing that, you know. But this is the stuff, you know. We need to get used to those kind of, you know, to whatever it is. It's like basic things, you know. It's privacy. Um, mostly, it's like personal things, you know. It's like how to not annoy, you know, the other people mostly. And also, but also when it comes to data, you know, it's like what's my personal data worth, you know. Currently, like the, the most of the people, I think they don't even understand the the concept, you know, of Google that Google actually makes money through that exchange, you know, that you do, getting a free service or that you provide data. You know, that's basic, that's a business model. 
also Facebook, you know, they didn't have a business, like a business model. They don't, they didn't have like a revenue, you know, for a long time, you know, they got better and better in like social, in being a social network, but how to monetize that, you know, that's a big question. And I think that's great, you know, if you have an investor just say like, oh, don't worry, you know, we find a way once we have like a lot of users, you know, and if the service is good, and I'm pretty sure that's, that's true. But again, like, you know, it just takes a while, you know, until we getting used to that. And now is the time to, to shape that stuff, I believe, still. Any more questions? Please. Um, the, the slide where the artificial intelligence goes up and the human intelligence goes up, mm -hmm. and how serious you are about this, because I, I, feel, I, I disagree with that, because using the real man doesn't mean you're getting lazy by not using the real man. Because you have more time to pick somebody, if you're an unknown safety plan, and use the real man, it takes ages. I use Apple Mac or Google Mac. I can learn many, many things at the same time. So. Yeah, that's, that's the question, right? Because, you know, you are totally right. I think I agree to you with a certain degree, except for, uh, except for that whatever you haven't actually somehow experienced, let's say, I think there is, I mean, there is two things. The one is like in Korea, this digital dementia, as they call it, it's, it has an effect. It's measurable. Secondly, like in London, you know, the cab drivers, that's like probably the most prominent example, you know, um, that, you know, that proves that our brains actually, that you can train it, you know. Like the London cab drivers, you know, these old nice guys, you know, they need to know every street in the city because that's just part of the test you know you have to pass the test else you're getting no taxi license you know and you see that actually there's something happening with their brain like in their physical appearance you know it's really like training the muscles basically so there is so what i think is happening when i use a navigation system is that i just have no idea about a particular area of the town for example it's just gone you might say this is and I agree, you know, it might be totally non-relevant, you know. Why should I care? I have the opportunity. If I want to know more about it, I can still switch to an analog map. All I'm saying is like that there is like obviously something, we are losing also some things, you know. We don't only gain by digital stuff, you know. Uh, but we don't do that consciously because usually we are just doing whatever everybody else is doing, you know. We just follow. Maybe it's right, it's, it's new age, so maybe you don't need physical maps anymore. You're not going to learn from that city because you train your brain. I mean, for the printing industry, like maps were always like uh, one of the the highest achievements, you know, in printing quality because you print like up to 27, 28 different colors, like spot colors on top of each other. So that is uh, like needs precision. So I hope that the maps won't die out too soon. But. Um, yeah, but you're right, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, it's more like it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a provocation, but this is like something that has been around for long. A friend told me that um, at some point uh, some king wanted to put up like signs to point at the castle, you know, and of course there were others just like, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, you know. The people are getting, they don't have any clue, you know, about the landscape anymore, you know, because before that, they, of course, they followed paths, you know, and had like different systems, you know. <laughs> to us, that seems like prob probably equally ridiculously than this discussion we are having in 20 years, you know, back, you know, like analog versus where is this digital map. But it's worth to uh, think about it, you know. Once you would have, if you jump ahead of time, you know, let's say we leave the navigation discussion and think about like whatever, it's like um, 2035 or so, you know, it's like, what else do I think is worth remembering or worth dealing with, with you know, and, you know, what, like for example, my taxes, you know, I don't wanna, you know, if any possible, you know, I just don't wanna understand and I don't, I don't even want to have to deal with it, you know. No. And, and, and I mean, understanding I can, nowadays I cannot understand it anyways, you know, it's completely impossible, like the German tax law, you know. So, so drinks now. <laughs> Some final words, Anishka. No, there's no question. I just want to... Please.
I would like to just thank you very much for a really interesting talk. You you just gave us very many points to think about. So thank you very much.